Well, good morning and welcome to Chapter 2 of our course here in Criminal Law uh, on this rainy January morning uh, here in 2024. Some of you may be listening to this obviously a little bit later, um, but we've already laid a little bit of the foundation for the criminal law. And today we're going to be looking at um, a concept called jurisdiction, which is not to be confused with something we're about to discuss in a moment about venue. But again, um, if you're following along, this will be the second attempt. We'll try to keep this lecture at a, a less than an hour. It's not a particularly long uh, lecture for us, but there'll be a few digressions here. And then one of the pieces of supplemental material I hope to get posted this week is going to be a uh, supplement on North Carolina law because we're going to start talking uh, more about North Carolina and as it relates to uh, criminal law because this course obviously is being offered here in North Carolina. So let's uh, jump in. We've got our learning objectives. Um, not too much there that uh, need concern most of us. Uh, these are just simple requirements. We're going to talk about um, the different ideas of jurisdiction and this is a a little bit more complicated than it first appears like very much uh, most of the criminal law. Okay, so let's start off with a very simple definition about jurisdiction. So <clears throat> jurisdiction is the uh, simply is the authority of a court system and the emphasis there is the term system to hear and decide a particular case. So if we're looking at the criminal law um, if you were to commit a murder in Raleigh, North Carolina, the system that has jurisdiction is the North Carolina courts. If you committed that murder in, say, Charleston, South Carolina, obviously South Carolina would have criminal jurisdiction. Now notice I didn't say something like, if you killed a citizen of North Carolina in say Montana, would North Carolina have jurisdiction? The, um, the answer is simply there is generally no, because most jurisdiction uh, under the criminal law is based on geography. The physical location at which the crime occurs. Now there are some exceptions to that. And sometimes different statutes give the authority of different jurisdictions, because there are multiple jurisdictions in the United States, to go ahead and bring people into the court system. So obviously, <clears throat> first of all, you have to understand that there are 50 state jurisdictions. Each one of the states in the United States um, has the authority and has established a criminal court system. Now obviously, sometimes crimes will occur outside the boundaries of the United States, or for whatever reason, other entities will be involved, specifically the federal government. <clears throat> now this could <clears throat> happen because the crime occurred outside of um, state jurisdiction. There, there was no state applies, but there is federal jurisdiction. So let's suppose you had a aircraft carrier that sailed from Norfolk, Virginia and was sailing to the Persian Gulf. And it's 100 or 200 miles off the coast of North Carolina, or wherever it is in the ocean, and a murder occurs on board. No state would have jurisdiction. Even if the person killed was a resident of uh, Washington State, Washington State wouldn't have jurisdiction. Even if the person that did the killing was an uh, individual from Massachusetts, Massachusetts wouldn't have jurisdiction. That would be a strictly federal jurisdiction. And you can, if you think about it, create other scenarios whereby murders could occur where there is some sort of United States authority, but there's no states involved. Having said that, and that's a, a long digression here, probably 99% of all murder cases, probably at least 95% of all felonies that are heard in courts are heard in the state courts. So by far, and this will play into um, our discussion of uh, North Carolina supplemental material in the next uh, next chapter or so. By far, um, the states do most of this. Jurisdictional is very much a state um, idea. And also, please remember that each state is free to construct its own criminal justice system. So it can define what constitutes a crime. Is a gambling a crime? 
it is in North Carolina, it is not in Nevada. Uh, is murder a crime? Well, that's a crime everywhere, but the penalties or the specific breakdowns of the crime can differ greatly. Now, the next concept to talk about is venue. And venue is a related concept, um, but it can be pretty important. Now, not as much for this class, but particularly for police officers, and uh, obviously our program here at Wake Tech is geared towards a lot of that. Um, but also for attorneys, paralegals, judges, and that's the concept of venue. And venue is what specific court inside the jurisdictional system hears the case. So going back to our original example and the example here from the slide. If you committed a murder in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, yes, the state of North Carolina would have jurisdiction. You would be charged in the North Carolina courts. However, North Carolina has divided up its uh, geographical boundaries into different um, judicial districts. So proper venue, since the crime occurred in Raleigh, North Carolina, would be that North Carolina court that sat with authority over Raleigh. Now, every state might be slightly different. Uh, some states might break them up by just by county. Other states might break them up by borough if you're in Alaska or parish if you're in Louisiana. Most will group together low population counties. Um, but if you had a very populous county like Wake County is um, and you killed someone, you'd be in, let's just call it the, the first, it's actually the 10th, but let's call it the first judicial district of North Carolina. If you killed someone in Mecklenburg County, which is probably the most populous county in North Carolina, it's where Charlotte is. Um, you might be in the second district. However, if you killed someone in um, a relatively sparse population of county, like say Robeson um, or Lenore or Mitchell County in the mountains. Uh, now Mitchell County in the mountains has very small population. So it's actually combined with several counties into a judicial district. So it wouldn't just be the, the um, capital of uh, Mitchell County, North Carolina, is a very small town called Bakersville. It's not even the largest city. The largest city in Mitchell County is called Spruce Pine. But the court would sit in the, usually in the capital of the county, the county seat. So your, your murder case, if you committed it in Mitchell County, very well could be <clears throat> Bakersville, Mitchell County. If you killed someone in Raleigh, uh, you'd be tried in the Superior Court, County of Wake, because you also have to remember that in North Carolina, we break our courts, our trial courts, into two uh, separate entities. We call them the District Courts, which handle most of the misdemeanors, excuse me, and the Felony Courts, which handle, um, uh, which are called Superior Courts. Okay, moving on then. <coughs> Let's talk a little bit about that federal government. The American uh, system of government has preserved the idea that each one of the states are sovereign entities in perpetual union with the federal government. So no state has the authority to remove itself from the United States. Having said that, within that system, each state is granted a great deal of leeway about what it can do, how it's set itself up. So under the American system, each one of the states has been given the primary power to maintain public order. And this includes passing criminal laws, uh, exercising you know, enforcement of those laws. And we call this broadly police power. Now the federal government does not have any inherent or assumed police powers. So one of the things that um, goes on if the federal government wants to make something criminal is um, and establish jurisdiction thereby is they have to point to the Constitution and say right here is where we get the authority to make this a crime and bring you into federal court. So the, the most common way in which that's done is something called the Commerce Clause. And this is in Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution. Now, if you're not familiar with the United States Constitution, uh, the Constitution's 
first three articles set up the federal government. Article 1 establishes the legislature. Article 2 establishes the executive branch of the presidency. Article 3 establishes the courts. But the Commerce Clause is not in Article 3. It's in Article 1. And what it says is Congress has the power to, quote, and that's the quote there at the bottom, bottom, regulate commerce among the several states. Now what that means is the legislature, the House of Representatives, and the federal government can pass a law, excuse me, and the Senate can pass a law if it relates to commerce or trade, economic interaction between the states. And if you think about it, almost everything does. If you wanted to make it a crime to a federal crime to uh, gamble or commit prostitution uh, across state lines. You could you could point to the Commerce Clause and say it is illegal to traffic in human beings because what you're doing is you are moving people between and amongst the states and even if it's a criminal enterprise it's still commerce. So having said this um, Almost everything can be brought into the federal government if it wants to. Now, there are two broad, and we're really kind of going outside the scope of the course, but we've got a little extra time in this lecture. There are two broad interpretations of the Constitution currently. There's what's called the strict constructionalists that will say you only have that authority that is specifically granted, the federal government only has that authority, in the Constitution. You have to read the Constitution as it's written. Um, and then there are what are usually called the living constitutionalists, and I'm grossly simplifying their positions, who believe that the Constitution is a living and changing document, that it expands, it's particularly expanded in the uh, 20th century to include a lot of behavior. And now that we're in the 21st century, uh, the federal government can regulate and create criminal law almost anywhere it wants. There's been a little bit of blowback, a little bit of restriction of that, but not a lot. Okay, let's go to our next slide. Um, an activity solely within a single state can be regulated by the states and local communities, but not by the federal government. Now, what that means is, let's go back to our original example. Let's suppose that I um, shot and killed someone in Raleigh, North Carolina. That is not a federal crime. One of the reasons it's not a federal crime, but not the only reason it's not a federal crime, is that it's not commerce. Um, the action occurred solely within the state's jurisdiction, and there's no way Congress can extend its power in and say, okay, we're going to try you for murder. <coughs> Excuse me. Having said that, I want you to think for a moment um, that there's other ways the federal government can get in here. So, uh, for example, there have been instances where there have been homicides committed in the United States, and it seems, at least to outside observers, that the state has little interest in prosecuting or they're failing to prosecute. So what the federal government had done and has done is they have passed civil rights legislation because everybody across the United States is entitled to basic civil rights to process law. Um, so if you kill someone in Raleigh, North Carolina, it may not be a murder charge, but it might be a deprivation of civil rights. So you might be, if, and this happens sometimes with police officers who commit homicides, um, and they're not tried or they're acquitted at the state uh, level. Sometimes the federal government steps in and says, okay, we're going to try you for the deprivation of the individual civil rights. Having said that, remember that states and federal governments are two separate jurisdictions. Um, if you are just under the federal jurisdiction, or if we're just talking the federal jurisdiction here, it is a federal crime. So often these involve some aspect of some something the federal government is doing more than the states are doing. So uh, quick examples here at the bottom would be did you use the US mail? I mean the US mail is run by the federal government. So if you uh, sent a blackmail note, if you uh, tried to extort, if you tried to commit fraud, uh, and you used the U.S. mail, you've got a federal crime. Did you rob a bank? They might say, well, but banks are local, aren't they? Yes, they are. Uh, there are certainly local banks, but 
almost all banks are members of the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which means that uh, the federal government regulates that bank, and when you rob it, um, because the federal government has that authority, uh, you've committed a federal crime. Obviously, violation of federal income tax laws is another very one common. You know, the, the most famous example here is Al Capone, a notorious gangster in Chicago in the 1930s, killed lots of people, ran a bootleg empire, uh, sold illegal liquor, uh, extorted, beat, committed dozens of crimes, couldn't be convicted by the courts in Illinois, but he was convicted of income tax fraud by the federal government because he didn't pay his taxes. Another way in which the federal government gets jurisdictions is, did you commit an offense by or were you a federal officer? So if a U.S. Marshal committed a crime in North Carolina, the federal government might have jurisdiction. If a U.S. Marshal was shot at by someone in North Carolina, um, the federal government would have jurisdiction. Now, it doesn't mean that the state also doesn't. And then, as I said, there are crimes that are beyond the jurisdiction of any state or between the states, and the example there was that aircraft carrier off the coast. Okay. Other federal jurisdictional powers. Uh, crimes that affect interstate or international travel or communication. Now, an example here would be Again, tying it to the Commerce Clause there, did you do something that impacted trade, even illegal trade between the states? Did you move illegal drugs into the United States and sell them in Raleigh, North Carolina? It's a federal crime. Did you um, move drugs across the North Carolina border? Did you import some aspect? A example here, and you might not immediately think of this, but let's suppose you grew marijuana in Raleigh and you only sold it in Raleigh and you said, well, the federal government has no jurisdiction over me. Okay, well, where did you get the grow lights to grow marijuana illegally, we'll say? Did you get them through the U.S. mail? Congratulations, the federal government's going to have some way to reach in and make what you did criminal. Uh, and then, of course, there's crimes committed in the District of Columbia. Now, the District of Columbia, which lies between Virginia and Maryland, it was carved out in the U.S. Constitution as our capital. If you commit a crime in D.C., that is a federal crime. Um, you also can commit crimes if you were on a U.S. controlled ship or aircraft, or if you commit a crime overseas and you're in the U.S. military. All of those have jurisdiction under the federal government. Then there can be crimes that interfere with federally insured savings and loans, violation of federal income tax laws and attempts to overthrow the government. January 6th, I suppose, is one of the things we could talk about. That certainly is a federal crime. The protesters were in the District of Columbia. That already gives you kind of a geographical uh, right to charge them. And then they entered the U.S. Capitol. That's a federal building uh, and assaulted or attempted to assault uh, U.S. officials and committed trespass. Therefore, they're chargeable. Um, recently, we're having a debate about can states enforce immigration law? Can they restrict um, or restrain uh, federal officials? And, you know, the answer there is probably going to be no. Um, but we'll, we'll see how that one plays out. So let's go back to our murder example, which is probably much closer to what's going on uh, it, for 99.9% .9 of the cases. Um, <clears throat> situations which the federal government might have jurisdiction in criminal homicide. Again, did it occur in a U.S. territory? Um, so if you were on, say, the island of Guam, which is an unincorporated U.S. territory, or if you were uh, in a special maritime situation, if you were on board that aircraft carrier, then there is deaths that result from terrorism, sabotage, or reckless negligent destruction of federal transportation facilities. So obviously the the people, individuals, the terrorists who flew those planes into the towers on 9-11 committed acts of terrorism. Uh, anyone that aided and assisted them, because they were all killed, um, would, be chargeably, would be chargeable federally. Uh, is the victim a high-ranking U.S. government official? Let's suppose a terrorist organization decided that they wanted to kill the President of the United States. Uh, and they took a shot at him in Raleigh, North Carolina. Even if it was a domestic, let's suppose it was 
uh, a radicalized Ku Klux Klan member, and they tried to kill the President of the United States in Raleigh. <coughs> it would still be joint jurisdiction, by the way. Um, Raleigh would still have, uh, the crime would have occurred in Raleigh, so it, still the state could charge that individual with murder, but so could the federal government because he's a, a specific U.S. government official. Now, there still needs to be a statute. So, uh, now this is going way back in the past, but the last president who was actually assassinated in the United States was uh, John F. Kennedy in 1963, and he was killed in Dallas, Texas. I believe, and um, I'm going out on a limb here, I believe there was no specific federal statute at that point that would have allowed uh, Lee Harvey Oswald to be tried federally. Um, I think they probably could have shoehorned something in. But I believe since then there has been the passage of very specific legislation saying if this, this, or this official is attacked. When a death con occurs in connection with any federal crime, so let's suppose you committed <clears throat> some sort of fraud or um, the trafficking of individuals across the U.S. border, and that individual dies, then uh, you can be tried um, federally. When a homicide occurs uh, during an offense defined by the Civil Rights Act of 1968, that was that one I mentioned earlier. So let's suppose a police officer um, shoots someone and for whatever reason the state does not prosecute. Now this was much more common during the civil rights disturbances in the 1960s, and particularly in the southern states, but some of the Midwestern, and even some of the northern states, where you would have a black individual killed by a white cop since Jim Crow was in place, and there were there was almost no ways to convict a white person of killing a black person in the South. Um, they would escape, uh, escape prosecution. So in 1968, <clears throat> Congress says, okay, well, we've had enough of that. Uh, we're going to pass a law that says if you take someone's life, that is a deprivation of their civil rights. Obviously, the most important civil right is to be alive. Therefore, if you kill someone, we're going to charge you federally. And that allowed these police officers and others who had um, escaped uh, justice to be brought into the federal system. Another example... Um, when a U.S. citizen is killed anywhere in the world. Now, this is kind of reaching pretty far. What this is saying is that if, um, if you're in Italy or Lisbon or Bolivia and you were killed, um, the federal government, if they can get their hands on the person that killed you, can try you. Uh, this, is not a, this is not a jurisdictional. It's essentially saying a, if the person... Um, is a U.S. citizen, and anybody kills them outside of the United States, the federal government can try that individual. Um, here are some very common ones, additional ones that are used here. Um, unlawful flight statutes this is the Fugitive Fel Felony Felon Act. Federal kidnapping. Now, this came in. This actually has a pretty interesting here, uh, uh, history. It starts all the way back, right after the sec First World War when um, probably the most famous American in the early 20th century, a man named Charles Lindbergh, uh, was living in New Jersey, and his baby, the Lindbergh baby, was kidnapped. And um, there was a ransom demand. The baby turned up dead. Uh, Lindbergh was such a mega star, uh, so popular, the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic, um, that... It became very common from from this point on, this is 18 United States Code annotated section 1201, to prosecute anyone who commits a kidnapping. Particularly, we look for, did you cross a state line? Then we have the Federal Conspiracy Act, which is pretty common. And here's a big one, RICO, um, Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organization Act. During the early 1960s, the federal government led a war on organized crime, at this point primarily looking at the Italian Mafia. And the RICO Act was passed uh, in 63 and 64. It's later been modified somewhat <clears throat> a few times. But essentially it says if you run any sort of organized crime, 
gain any benefit from organized crime. Uh, the federal government, because that impacts interstate commerce, has the authority to try you. And this has a very, very broad reach. Um, if you commit a crime in federal domain. Now, North Carolina, there are certainly en enclaves here that are owned by the federal government, if we think about it. The, um, uh, the national parks. But the further out west you go, the more of America, the land itself, that is owned by the federal government. So by the time you're getting out to states like Nevada, um, you know, you can have 80 percent of the whole state's land owned by the federal government. And they may lease it out to, say, cattle ranchers or mining concerns, but it is a federal domain. Then we have federal enclaves, territories, and assimilated crime acts. Um, this has to do with parts of the world. Um, enclaves are parts of U.S. territories that are not states, um, but they're kind of in an, a transitional intermediate state. Uh, if you think about Guantanamo Bay in, in Cuba, Cuba, um, we have a 99-year lease on that, even though the Cubans don't really love the idea. Um, if you committed a crime there, um, you would be under federal law. All right. Federal enclaves, um, these are federally owned and controlled lands. You're going to find this in Article 4, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. And that that is really the authority of the federal government to um, do certain things. Now, you know, the United States uh, military is huge compared to just about any other military on the planet. There are lots of bases, Army posts, Navy yards, Air Force bases, Coast Guard station, Marines bases. Here in North Carolina, you have, uh, you know, a, a ton of these uh, different bases. You have the 82nd Airborne based here. You have uh, the 1st Marine Division of it is based down in Lejeune. Uh, you have Pope Air Force Base. Uh, I guess uh, it's now Fort Liberty for the 82nd Airborne. Um, if you were to commit a crime in any of these federal enclaves, um, you would be under federal jurisdiction and could be tried. National parks and forests, so if you're out in Yellowstone um, or most of Nevada, most of Alaska, uh, good parts of the federal states, uh, you'd be under federal law. If you commit a crime inside a federal building, almost every large city in the United States has federal buildings. You know, Raleigh has several where federal courts sit. These could be a bankruptcy court. These could be a federal office building. You know, it could be where there's an IRS, um, everybody's favorite federal organization. It could be an IRS building. That could be a federal crime. Or reservations. And there we're touching on the, um, uh, the indigenous nations, um, what pejoratively was called Indian reservations, but more properly um, the 500-odd tribes uh, or civilizations that existed or exist in the United States. All of those, if you can commit a crime there, can be a federal crime. Then we've got some nation-to-nation -nation jurisdiction. So the law of the nation follows its ships and aircrafts. So <clears throat> um, one of the things that, and that, that's somewhat self-explanatory, if your plane is taking off and it's outside of the state boundaries and you committed a crime on a plane, you could be charged federally. Uh, we do have a little bit of talk about in that, that photo there of extraordinary rendition. This is the practice of seizing foreign nationals in one country and transporting them to another country for questioning or prosecution. Um, this, you know, if, if, if this is not to give you an exact analogy, but this uh, essentially is much like kidnapping someone or bounty hunting maybe is a much better example. Um, if you had uh, you know, we're, we're right now we're in the midst of the Israeli-Gaza war. Um, if the Israelis knew that someone from Hamas uh, was in, say, the island of Cyprus, theoretically they could seize that individual and fly him to Israel for trial. We could do much the same thing. And it's, it's really not a judicial process, it's more a police process or police power process. 
All right, nation to nation jurisdiction. Um, this is where it gets a little bit dicey. Um, we have the International Criminal Court. So, you know, think about the idea of what do you do with people who, under the guise of there's not going to be any penalties in this country because for whatever reason I control this country. It might be a narco-terrorist situation. It might be a genocidal situation. How do we handle them? So we have a very weak world government. Um, it's certainly not as strong as our national governments. But above, you know, if you think of it as a hierarchy where you have the, the, the counties you live under and they have some jurisdiction to make some things illegal, but not very much. You have the states that have more jurisdiction. They can make crimes. We've talked about that. We've got the federal government that can certainly make jurisdictions. Now, above that, we do have the world government, and this is the United Nations. Uh, since 1945, the conclusion of the Second World War, there has been this world government. Part of this world government has established different criminal courts that functioned at different times. Famously, after the defeat of Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan in 1945, we had uh, the war crimes trials. Those were kind of ad hoc, where we established them after the fact. Around about the turn of the 20th to 21st century, the International Criminal Court, the ICC, uh, was created uh, to punish people who committed war crimes. Um, so th the, the issue with this very often is, and we're not going to go too deep into this because we're straying pretty far outside of our bailiwick, is that, a, first of all, there has, there's almost no enforcement mechanism. If I say to someone who commits a war crime and say, you know, make up a country, uh, Fredonia, that's an imaginary country, and I say, I want to prosecute the general who committed war crimes in Fredonia, how are you going to get them? Are you going to declare war in Fredonia, invade them, capture them, bring them for trial? So it can be very difficult to enforce this, but sometimes individuals are captured and brought, uh, turned over very often by new governments for war crimes, sometimes crimes of genocide. And they are brought to the International Criminal Court, which has sat in different places. Uh, turn of the century, in the 20th century, it was at The Hague. Um, it can be in Brussels. It can be in different places. The ICC um, is somewhat contentious, of course, because uh, to be fair about this, it tends to just catch um, the willing countries that are willing to turn over people and small fry. Uh, smaller countries are much more vulnerable to jurisdictional issues here. So if, you know, Vladimir Putin of Russia is accused of committing a war crime, there is no way he's going to the International Criminal Court. Russia is not giving him up. <clears throat> There's really no way to enforce that. Okay, <clears throat> we're pretty far outside the scope, so let's, let's go on to extradition. <clears throat> final point that we need to consider here is what happens and if, if you look at this map <clears throat> these are countries where there is some sort of extradition to or from the United States. Uh, extradition is when one person gets to another country having committed a crime in the first country. So what we seek to do, let's suppose you killed someone in Raleigh and you fled to uh, Bolivia in South America what we would seek to do there is go to the Bolivians and say we have a treaty with you uh, that says if one of our citizens commits a crime you agree to turn them over to us. Um, now this can happen state to state in the United States because remember they're sovereign entities. You get to uh, you commit a crime in Raleigh, North Carolina and you flee to Virginia and you are arrested in Virginia. North Carolina has to extradite you from Virginia to North Carolina. It's a bit of a process, but it, it almost always goes forward. International jurisdiction is a little bit tougher because whereas the state-to-state -state extradition, you've got the federal constitution, you've got a whole series of laws, internationally you have to have a willing government. There is extradition that's permitted and extradition is not permitted. Now, one of the interesting things is the United States is one of the last Western countries, Western democracies, <coughs> that has the death penalty. So if you actually flee 
from the United States and get to say Canada and you have committed a capital crime. You kill someone in Raleigh, the Raleigh Prosecution's Office in Wake County says we're going to charge you with first degree murder and if convicted we're going to execute you. Canada may not extradite you because they don't believe in the death penalty so they might say the only way we're going to turn them back over to you is you have to agree that yeah you can charge them, yeah you can put them in jail for life, but no you can't execute them. And if you don't we won't extradite them. So, and sometimes you can flee to a country where there's no extradition. You get to Cuba from the United States, there's no extradition treaty. I don't believe there's one in Venezuela anymore either. So those would be two big ones here in the, in the 21st century. Alright, rendition and the war on terror, we've already talked about this. Um, uh, this little quote, the FBI said, the law has changed, there are no lawyers. The scary thing for me about uh, the idea of jurisdiction and extraordinary rendition is that really since the 1500s, there has been a formalized legal system where if you were going to bring someone into custody, there was a way in which that person could challenge their custody. So you arrest me, you put me in jail, there was a way that I could say, all right, I want access to the courts. Tell me what you're charging with. Tell me you're just not holding me because you want to. The problem with the extraordinary rendition is very often people were, and still are, uh, seized overseas, brought, uh, Guantanamo is the classic example, but the United States is not alone in doing this. Uh, you would seize someone, you would bring them to Guantanamo, there's really no trial. So all we have is the accusation you committed a crime. So that's why this FBI agent say the law has changed. There's no lawyers. Uh, we have people sitting in Guantanamo since the early 2000s. They've been in there for 20 years without a trial. Are they terrorists? Yeah, in all probability they are some form of terrorist. Do we, are we sure they're terrorists? Well, there hasn't been a trial to confirm it. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about the military. Uh, there is a separate system for the military. Like I said, the United States military is very large. It's one of the largest on the planet. So you've got more than a million people. Uh, you know, during wartime, that can swell up to two, four, eight million people in the United States military. So there has been, for more than two centuries, a military code. And the current name of that code is the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the, the UCMJ. And it establishes that if you're in the U.S. military, and that would be the uh, United States Marine Corps, the United States Space Force, the United States Army, United States Air Force, um, the United States Navy, those are the big five, Coast Guards come in eventually, six. If you're one of those, okay, and you commit a crime on a military base, um, if you are a service member, so you're in you're in Camp Lejeune and you, you are a uh, Marine Lance Corporal and you kill someone, you can be tried by a U.S. military court. But military courts have no jurisdiction over U.S. citizens who commit crimes, even on military bases. However, um, if you are a civilian and you go to work for the military, you often will waive or make yourself subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Um, currently, and this is very contentious, um, non-citizen terrorists seized by the military can be tried and detained by the military. Non-citizen enemy combatants may be held by the military. Now you might ask, what's the difference between a combatant and a terrorist? Nobody knows. Enemy combatants who are U.S. citizens are entitled to trial in federal court. That again is very contentious. I would advise you if you want to read more about this to uh, read a case called Rumsfeld v. Pedalia, where a U.S. citizen was uh, f uh, flown in, uh, was flying in and was held in Chicago. He was transferred to a na Navy brig in South Carolina and eventually he wound up um, even though he's U.S. citizen seized on U.S. soil outside of the regular criminal justice system. I'm not going to go too far there because that's more a constitutional law question. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Indian tribes. And that's, as I said, somewhat of a pejorative term. 
Quickly, what you have to understand is that when the Europeans arrive in the 1490s, there are roughly 500 nations um, in what will become North America. Um, now, many of these were formalized tribes, some were coalescing into tribes, some were disintegrating away from tribes, some were in, in larger governments with multiple tribes. So, for example, the Iroquois in what is now New York, <clears throat> there were the five great tribes. Um, you have kind of different branches of tribes. Then you have tribes that never quite coalesced, um, and they are not recognized necessarily as Indian tribes. Having said all this, to lay the groundwork that it's a, a pretty complex idea, Native uh, Americans um, are sovereign entities or sovereign nations, much like the states. So if you are a member of the Lakota, the Sioux, up in the Badlands, say, of uh, the Dakotas, and you commit a crime, uh, very often that crime will occur on a Sioux or Lakota reservation. And this is an area that the federal government has a treaty, just like a treaty signed with Canada or, or England, um, has a treaty with the Lakota, and, and that treaty says this area is a reservation. Now, and, and Indians or Native Americans are U.S. citizens. But if you commit um, a crime, um, traditionally you, you could make the argument that yeah we're going to um, we're going to try you in the by that sovereign entity. However, it's it's a pretty complex relationship. Major crimes are not tried in by the tribal courts, um, and you can debate about this quite a bit. <clears throat> but basically. Crimes committed by non-Indians are outside of the jurisdiction of tribal courts, and major crimes like murder are not tried at tribal courts. But less serious crimes are. Native Americans who commit crimes while not on or within their reservation are subject to wherever they are. So it's kind of not a two-way street. If um, let's just if a Native American living in Dakota goes into Bismarck, North Dakota, and commits a crime, state of North Dakota can try him. If a U.S. citizen, not a Native American, goes into one of the Lakota reservations and commits a crime, a serious enough crime, the tribal courts can't try him. He's going to have to be tried under the state law. Um, the general rule uh, has been historically that tribal courts could try you for misdemeanors or minor crimes. Now recently there has been a lot of pushback about that and we've really moved much more towards letting these uh, tribal courts handle more serious cases and increase their sentences. This is one of those under the radar struggles about civil rights that most of us, particularly here in the East, really don't come across that much. You know, there are, because yes, North Carolina has probably one of the largest, if not the largest, Native American populations east of the Mississippi. But it pales in comparison to the percentage of Native Americans as a percentage of a state population if you go west of the Mississippi. All right, um, there's a thinking point slide here. Um, in 1977, Roman Polanski, who's a very famous Hollywood director, was charged with drugging and raping a 13-year-old girl. So he had pleaded guilty to a lesser charge, um, but he fled to France. Um, and, of course, he committed this crime, rape, drugging rape. And this is, what, uh, 50, almost 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago. Um, yeah, just about 50 years ago. In 2011, um, he was taken into... 2010, excuse me, he was taken into custody by Swiss authorities on an international arrest warrant. And the, because this crime occurred, it was a Hollywood crime, uh, this crime occurred in California, California still had an active warrant, so they tried to get him. So eventually Polanski, by the way, flees to Poland, but you can watch the extradition video, um, and that's linked um, in 
<coughs> that's linked in your uh, your Cengage. So if you want to watch this, there are several opinions in the video regarding the extradition. Um, should he be extradited? Should he not be extradited? Um, what happened? Where is he? What you're going to find out is basically um, he didn't get extradited. Another thinking point here is that on April 1st, uh, 2010, in the Indian Ocean, um, a small skiff carrying Somali pirates attacked U.S. Navy frigates. Now, <clears throat> this is interesting, I think, because right now, off the uh, coast of uh, <coughs> Yemeni, um, Houthi rebels are firing rockets at ships. Some of those ships are U.S. flag ships. Um, crazily enough, some of them are U.S. Navy ships. So what could happen very easily is, uh, first of all, obviously, there's the President of the United States may order a strike against these people, may attack them. But also, it's entirely possible that one or more of these Houthi rebels uh, might be taken into custody. And then the question would be, could they be tried? Um, <clears throat> do you think that you would have jurisdiction over these pirates? You know, pirates go back a very long time in American history. Um, the One of the first international operations that the United States ever performed was a war against the Barbary pirates, and this would be near Tunisia in North Africa, in the Thomas Jefferson administration. Uh, there was wars against French privateers, uh, French-sponsored privateers. It wasn't a direct war against France during the quasi-war in the uh, John Adams administration. So now we're looking at, you know, 230 years ago. So very often the line between international behavior, war behavior, and criminal behavior gets very blurry when there's non-state characters involved. All right, the last thing to talk about is this Robert Bales video. Um, I'm not going to do a lot about it. You're free to look at them. Um, but again, <clears throat> do you charge individuals at the state or federal level? Do you extradite people away from our system? So let's suppose, and we won't go into the details of Mr. Bales just yet, but let's suppose an American commits a crime while he's overseas in the U.S. military. Um, and it might be a might be a war crime, right? Is America willing to let him be extradited back to Afghanistan to be tried? Now consider that today, when this was uh, initially prepared in 2018, the United States had a very robust presence in Afghanistan. We were still deep into the war. Um, that's ended. So right now, the government of Afghanistan is fairly hostile to the United States. Let's suppose the current government, run by the Taliban, says, well, we want, or the Taliban, like, uh, we want uh, this Sergeant Bales, or any fictitious U.S. soldier, if you want, to be extradited back here. How would America react? Now, you know, put it on the other foot. We want to be able to get people who commit crimes overseas, either through extraordinary rendition <clears throat> or through extradition. Other countries might want the same rights. Um, at what point does um, the world government have the right to enforce this? So, you know, one of the contentious issues we could talk about, and this would be something you could reflect upon, again, we're in the midst of the um, Gaza war between the Hamas uh, terrorists and the Israeli IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. Um, what if the, you know, Obviously, you might want to try individuals from Hamas who went into the state of Israel, kidnapped people, killed people, brought them back, held them. Okay, so you get those terrorists. The International Court has jurisdiction. These seem to be war crimes. What about the Israeli behavior afterwards? Right now, South Africa has brought a charge in the international community that Israel is committing war crimes because of their behavior and their response. You know, do you have an unlimited right to do whatever you want if someone commits a war crime against you? Or are there limits? And do you recognize those limits? All right, well, that, that kept it right at about 50 minutes where I wanted it. A uh, little bit long-winded, 
concluded these thinking points at the end, which I usually don't on these slides just because. Um, however, uh, take a look at it. We'll be moving on to Chapter 3 next time. And have a good afternoon, a good morning, or a good evening, if that. And I will talk to you with Chapter 3 whenever you're ready.